The audit service has been in existence long before Ghana's independence. Upon reclaiming sovereignty, it became one of the institutions that segued into the new era. Today, it is a public office backed by the 1992 Constitution to ensure financial propriety in all public and quasi-public offices, including the presidency and our courts. But the mismanagement of public funds and the lost battle against corruption have left more questions than answers. On this edition of Hot Issues, we explore how well the Office of the Auditor General has served the citizen. Ghana's 67th independence anniversary provides a fine opportunity to take stock of the institution and who better than the man who fought corruption and in his own words, corruption fought back. How does the country jump that header? I am Kemeni Amano and my guest on Hot Issues is former Auditor General Daniel Domelovo. You're welcome to Hot Issues. Thank you very much. I want us to look at Ghana as a country and the fight against corruption. Despite the Office of the Auditor General transcending the 1992 Constitution, we find that there's still a lot of financial misconduct in the public sector. Why is that? Well, the truth about life is that wherever people find opportunities, they will like to misbehave or abuse the opportunity if the controls are not working. And like I keep saying that if there are no consequences for financial malpractices, if people think they can get away with it, it will continue. So I believe that because the system has not been set up clearly to ensure that it doesn't matter uh, who you are, if you go contrary to the rules, the sanctions will be mini, uh, administered on you. That's why I think that a level of impunity is, and it's, it's keep growing mm -hmm. and growing every time. So I think that may largely account for where we are now. I mean, but should we always be punishing people for them to do right? I mean, at some point, we, the individual public sector workers would have to start to take responsibility for how they behave with the public purse. It's debatable, but to me, where there are no deterrence in misbehavior, people tend to misbehave. I give example or analogy of the same Ghanaian who is transported or travels to a different environment. Maybe he arrives in London today or UK, uh, US today. Without any orientation, he starts behaving because you know this system will not tolerate me. I'll give you a very quick example of my friend who picked me from my house. We got to the airport. We flew to London together. And the next morning, he was driving. In Ghana, he was driving. He gave the key to the driver and went away. And the next morning, he was driving. After 30 minutes, I asked him, Nana, what has changed? And he said, what? He said, the way you were driving yesterday is very different from the way you are driving today. You are even smiling at pedestrians who are not close to the road. You stop, smile at them, allow them to cross. But you are not giving that opportunity to Ghana. What has changed? He said, well, <laughs> this system will not tolerate you. Indeed. So the system tolerates misbehavior. I see. Hence, it is growing. So, so in, in, in our case, who should be doing the uh, sanctioning? And what kinds of sanctioning are you talking about? What do you envisage? Well, when we talk about uh, the system should be working, uh, the back stops with the president the top of course discipline cannot be enforced from below it comes from the top down in actually in financial management we say it storms at the top and drizzles at the bottom if there's enough storm at the top the drizzles will be enough for us so the tone from the top actually determines whether the people are going to take it or not you go to some countries not even outside africa go to rwanda and see the tone from the top is very clear that you misbehave you face it so everyone is doing whatever it is. I was even telling some people that the level of cleanliness that I even find in their homes is interesting because they realize that it has become a culture more or less. You can't go out and misbehave. And that affects even behavior at home. So the first thing we do is to ensure that we have a leadership which is committed to doing this. 
That is why I believe many Ghanaians, including you, if you are not included, I was included, believe the president when he said, I will protect the public purse. And he said that if you want to make money, don't come into government. Mm -hmm. Go to the private sector. So we know this is a guy who is not going to spare anyone. So, and I've been in public service for a very long time. You may not know this. Whenever there is a change in government, public servants, they sit back and watch whether it's going to be business as usual or it's going to be a change. After a few months, they say, ah, it's business as usual. Really? You see them misbehaving. What, what, what was the consensus with the Yakufuado administration? Well, I... The, 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 the promises or the rhetorics was far, far, is far higher than what we are seeing on the ground. And of course, disciplinary measures are swiftly uh, put in place against those who don't belong to the group. But there are some people who we can all see clearly that this guy is committing uh, atrocities or infractions and he or she continuously get away with it. I see. But, you know, the president and this administration made some decisions, yeah. one of which was you. Yeah. We'll talk about that in a bit. But another decision they made was to set up the Office of the Special Prosecutor, yeah. which was also to tackle or help tackle corruption. I I again, I instead of analyzing the OSP, I want to find out from you how these institutions work together with the Office of the Auditor General. First and foremost, let me say that it is not the number of institutions that we have which will help us do the work. I find it also a bit even disturbing that any time Mr. A is not able to do his work, we set up Mr. B. Mr. B joins, he's not able to do, we put in Mr. Three, uh, Mr. C. So we keep creating several institutions. You notice that we have a police service. We have the criminal uh, CID or the criminal investigation department. There's something of financial uh, unit, I've forgotten the exact name. We have the uh, Yoko. We have Chiraj. Commission for Human Rights, established by the Constitution itself. We have several investigative financial intelligence unit, and now we have, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, Office of the Special Prosecutor. Well, if it is not working, what else are we going to have? Are we going to continue building several institutions, or we just strengthen the institutions on the ground, mandate them properly, and ensure that they deliver on their mandate? I, was of the, I, I am of the view or the opinion that if we, there was the need for bringing in uh, any other institution, we first look at the existing institutions and see, are they not capable of doing mm -hmm. what is supposed to be done? What is the missing link? Is it the legislation? So those powers can be given to existing institutions because, mind you, corruption, just as wasteful expenditure, equally denies citizens the benefit of the public funds. So if you are creating too many institutions which are not delivering, you are being wasteful. In fact, in South Africa, the law refers to it as wasteful and fruitless expenditure. I like it so much. It's a fruitless and wasteful expenditure. So if you continue creating fruitless and wasteful expenditure, it's as bad as corruption. Because at the end of the day, the public purse, which is supposed to use in serving the public interest, is not used do, in serving the Do you the think that's interest. what this government did with the creation of the OSB? I'm not saying directly, but what I'm trying to say is that they could, we could have first look at the existing institutions and see, can we change their mandate? And mind you, assuming today, in fact, if, God forbid, I'll never be a president of Ghana, so forget about it. If I were made a president, I would still look at the possibility of combining Yoko and uh, uh, Office of the Special Prosecutor. Do you know why? Because Yoko is already established in all the regions and the districts. So if you combine them, it saves the nation a lot of money. Now look at the amount of money which is being used to set up just the OSP. If we need to roll it out throughout the country, mm -hmm. how much do you think we need to do that? It's going to be a lot of money. So at the end of the day, there is a lot of fruitless and wasteful expenditure. Let's talk about when you were there, yeah. right? Uh, you started speaking about the limitations of uh, the, you know, the law that establishes the Office of the Auditor General. Uh, and, and, and you talked about how you, you'd have to go through Parliament for a long debate and, and, and all that. What other limitations exist as, as far as the establishment of the Auditor General's office is concerned? I don't see a legal limitation on the mandate of the Auditor General because Auditor General is not something unique to Ghana. It is a universal concept. And if you look at the concept uh, universally, you, you will agree with me that even the Ghanaian Auditor General is more powerful, he has more scope than many others. Except that 
In financial management, again, there's something we call segregation of duties. Eh? It's not like football where you can take ball from pool to pool. You must pass the ball to someone to also do. That is why you don't have one person going on the field, investigating, uh, prosecuting, and judging at the same time. Different layers must come into, uh, into play. So as far as the mandate of the Auditor General is concerned, I think it is adequate, except to say that utilizing the mandate is what where normally we fall short because utilize, utilizing the mandate requires that you step on toes. Like when you are going to disallow and say charge, you are sure that people will fight back, especially if they are one of the untouchables. That will definitely come. So it is not a matter of the law not being adequate. Some people also mistake, uh, mistakenly think that the Auditor General should also be prosecuting people. No, that is not part of the mandate, Auditor General's mandate. Do you, you, it, it's not, but do you think that it would give the Auditor General uh, more powers, perhaps, to be able to do what it's supposed to do, so you don't just bark? The Auditor General doesn't just bark. The Auditor General already bites. Because if I disallow and search, according to Section 17 of the Audit Service Act, if you are a public servant, that money should be taken from your salaries, so I can recoup it. Okay, so it does, it does not just back. And giving prosecutory uh, authority to the Auditor General, I think may be a good thing, but also uh, it is somebody's mandate. If we go under Article 88 of the Constitution of Ghana, that is the mandate of the Attorney General. So Attorney General should be doing his work instead of Auditor General now going to take over the Attorney General's work. I think what is necessary rather is the Attorney General coming in timely to assist the Auditor General to prosecute some of those cases. How many of such collaborations did you have while you were in office? I, I must say next to zero. We didn't have that uh, level of collaboration. Uh, what I did was every single disallowance or search charge that I did, I copied the Attorney General. Mm. He's, he was always on it because I thought it was a potential case of uh, criminality or something of the sort. And, of course, it is only he who determines what is... Uh, prosecute, uh, can be prosecuted and cannot be and prosecuted. And did you ever hear back so, on those that you wrote to? No, I didn't. I remember even once I even wrote the Attorney General to say that according to a provision, I think under Section 27 of the PFM Act, he is supposed to produce a report to show the status of how he has implemented the recommendations of Auditor General and follow up on his cases and send it to Parliament, copy the Minister of Finance and the Auditor General, but I've not seen my copy. So, uh, so you should serve me with copies of what you have done I mean, done face, so face value, how many cases did you copy the Auditor General in and you never heard back? Attorney General, you the, mean? The, the, the Attorney General, yes. Several. There are several. I issued more than 100 certificates and none of them went without copying him. Because before designing the system, we looked at how do we tackle it? Who are the stakeholders? By law, who are the people who must be informed? And remember, I have a legal team. So my legal team advised that since some of these things, especially based upon uh, Occupy Ghana versus Attorney General, where in the, what we call it, um, consequential orders issued by the Supreme Court, they stated the last consequential order was to the Attorney General that he should take actions against people who have been surcharged or held responsible by the, by the Auditor General. Mm -hmm. So we thought it was necessary to bring the Attorney General to speed on what we are doing. Otherwise, he may say that, well, I don't know what the Auditor General is doing. I can't just go get up and picking people for prosecution. So that evidence didn't come. So we continue, when I was in office, I don't know what, what is happening now. When I was in office, each and every surcharge or disallowance was copied to. What do you think accounts for or accounted for the lack of um, interest on the part of the Attorney General, I beg your pardon, in responding to you uh, you know, as then an Auditor General? Well, I don't know what the reason could be, but uh, it is better they speak to it by themselves. Could, could that be, <laughs> you know, an example when you said that corruption fought back? Yes, but I'm going to give you hazard an opinion. I may not be right, I may be wrong, but uh, this is what I think. Mind you, the Attorney General sees as a Minister of Justice in Cabinet. Most of the decisions that you may be going against has something to do with the Attorney General or decisions that you was part of. So how are you going to get the collaboration? Let me give you an example. In the Crow and Associates case, for instance, 
If you see the agreement which was signed between Crow Associate and the senior minister, it was witnessed by the attorney general. So why do you think that he will be interested or she will be interested? That time it was uh, a lady. So she will be yes. interested. So many times people have been calling for separating the office of the attorney general from the minister of justice. I'm in for it because that will have brought about that, uh, uh, solve that conflict where you are part of the team which is taking the decision and you are the one who is supposed to be prosecuting at the same time. So on the side of impact, it means yeah. that all these over 100 cases that you copied the Attorney General in, whether it was to disallow an expenditure or it was to search out somebody, uh, we cannot tell at the moment whether or not uh, you know, they were done. No, I'm not aware of any action taken by the Attorney General. And so we don't know if the money was got back or whether the expenditure was even disallowed. The expenditure was not to be disallowed by the Attorney General. Right. The disallowance and surcharge is supposed to be done by the, the Auditor General, which I did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the next level is to go to court and enforce it. Right. That enforcement is what was lacking. So, it, on your books, yes. you could have surcharged. Yes. But for the culprit yes. to be able to pay back the money they have expended unlawfully, yeah. it may not have happened. I think, I think for to, to go to court against that culprit, it is the Attorney General. And that might not have happened. A few people voluntarily paid their, their search charges. But I think it may be about two or three cases. It's not a lot of them. Majority were waiting to see what happens after the search charge. Is there a, an expiry date as to, you know, working on these certificates that you, you copied the Attorney General in that if Gloria Kufu couldn't work on them, uh, then uh, Godfrey Dame could be working on those now? Well, let me say that there are two things that I know. One of them, according to uh, Section 17 of the Audit Service Act, the one who is surcharged has up to 60 days to challenge the surcharge, which if you don't surcharge, uh, you don't challenge, then it crystallizes as a debt for you. So the state will have to take action and collect the money. Now, the next thing you are asking is, if the state didn't take action to collect the money, Indeed. does it expire? That one, I'm not competent to talk about that. We leave that in the domain of the lawyers. Because there is a statute of limitation. And the statute of limitation specifies some particular categories of actions which are limited. I don't know whether this one... Because, Has got any, yes, any statute and of I've always been asking the lawyers whether you can use an act of parliament to limit a constitutional provision. Because the constitution, from my point of view, which is in line with uh, Article 1 of the Constitution, Clause 2, says it's the supreme law of the country. So can you actually uh, go in and remove or revoke the orders of the CEO of the, co the company? That's the question. So, I mean... Collectively, when we look at the situation, you did your job, but it also came to naught. I wonder if we can say it came to naught. Because you see, one of the things that did not come into public notice is that in the process of disallowing and surcharge, a lot of the issues got resolved. Many people hear of it and they come and pay and said, I don't want that uh, problem on my, on my decks. A second thing which do not, uh, people do not easily appreciate is the deterrence that it brings. That mm -hmm. is even higher. When people get to know that, oh, a minister can be held responsible and he's being held responsible. So the thing he wants to do, he stops doing it. That is the value of a financial management control where it is deterring. So we can't say it came to naught. It added so much value. Mm. We'll talk a bit more about the recent ones that we've seen. Uh, but uh, while we are on the subject of uh, uh, culprits, yeah. uh, if you like, um, which institutions would you consider very notorious when it comes to financial misconduct in the public sector? Well, I can't describe them as notorious, but where infractions happen... So usually, they are very notorious for infractions, <laughs> no, aren't they? I don't like to use that word notorious, because as far as I'm concerned, what we are addressing is Clause 5 of Article 1A7, which says when you identify irregularities, you bring it up. So it's the irregularities that uh, we bring up. You can talk about the Ministry of Finance itself because that is where the cooking is done. A lot of the resources are there, so you can be sure that there will be a lot of infractions or irregularities there. Then the big ministries like education, health, roads, 
there you will find a lot of infractions. Uh, when we come back, more on the institutions, but I also want us to, to delve deeper into issues that have been raised while you occupied the office of the Auditor General. I want us to look at some of those issues that came up while you were Auditor General. And then you talked about deterrence, but how much of it has taken place since you left office, uh, given the recent Public Accounts Committee hearings? We'll be right back. Welcome back to Hot Issues. My guest is Daniel Domelovo, who is former Auditor General of the Republic of Ghana. Uh, thank you so much for your patience and sitting with us indeed. But um, I was saying earlier that we, while we are looking at uh, some of the infractions that have happened, yeah. we know during your time you also had issues of unearned salaries. Uh, unearned salaries. Unearned yeah. salaries, yeah. Uh, monies that had gone into wrong hands. Tell us the nature of infractions that you, you, you find uh, uh, come up a lot during your audit. Yeah, if you study the audit report, you will see that uh, a lot of the infractions or the irregularities have to do with on end salary, as you have said. Uh, a lot of people might have resigned, sacked, dismissed, died, whatnot, and, or left the institution, so to say, but their salaries are still being paid, and I think that is terribly wrong, and we normally bring that to our attention. But procurement offenses mm -hmm. is the leading, actually, a very serious one. There are a lot of uh, infractions uh, from the procurement side. To be honest with you, at times even I draw the auditor's attention that some of the procurement irregularities are eluding themselves. They are not very much. Uh, you see, it is said that if you don't take time, you may think everything is okay. But then if you do... As they say, the devil is in the details. Mm -hmm. If you do a more deep dive, you will see that there are uh, a lot of irregularities. For instance, there's one common one which was beating my people and currently is still beat almost all of you in the media. You will see that there is an approval from public procurement authorities. Say, oh, you got PPA approval. Who says PPA has mandate to approve? It is not. Read at uh, session uh, 40 and 41 of the Public Procurement Act. It is the Public Procurement Board, not the PPA. Mm. So any approval that you have seen anywhere, I saw one on National Communication, and the approval is given by PPA, is fake. They don't have that mandate. So okay. if I were auditing, I was going to challenge them mm. to say, by which mandate did you give that, that approval? It was the same issue in the Crow and Associates. Honorable Safu Mafu was given approval by ABIJ, not the board. I see. So to me, it was not an approval. You get the point? Mm -hmm. So many people don't get this. Once they see PPA letterhead and see approval has been given, they start running, oh, they, there is an approval. Mm -hmm. Say, no. If you check the approvals, you see one of them, the, all that the chief executive does is communicates the approval of the board. He says that the board meeting held on this date, that is board number, uh, meeting number, so, so and so, approval was given you. That is the genuine one. There are others where they will say PPA hereby gives you approval. And that is not in consonance with the law. So many times, there are several tricks or things which go on. And if you don't have much insight into these things, and of course, you don't read the law thoroughly, you may easily be persuaded to say that, oh, everything is above board. But many times, it is not above board. I see. Yes. And, and one of the issues we also saw and continue to see with procurement is unlawful soul sourcing. Yes. What, what contributes to that? Because it is the easier way of giving the contract or the, the procurement to a particular entity or person that you want to do. And mind you, when people see uh, PPA approval also, let me finish a bit of it and you get it right. Even when the board has given approval, they have not been mandated by the law to just approve. There, there are conditions under which they should approve. Is it that you are the only person who produced that item? Is there an emergency that we cannot go through the process? Is there any disaster that they are addressing? Is it of national security issue? There are conditions stated in the law. So even if the board approves, where it says that the board at this meeting gave the approval, they have to state the clause under which they are approving for us to know. Because most of the times, if you read the act, you will see that this is not a situation where the uh, board has the right or their mandate to approve has been activated, mm. but they exercise it. So the single source procurement is the 
clear avenue in procurement or the procurement method which normally allows people to pass the ball to who they want the ball to go to. Mm -hmm. So they want to clean this room and they think that contract to go to that my friend. So they say that ah, my friend has a cleaning institution and interestingly some of them, the day that we are, they are asking for the approval is when they were born. I mean, registered at the Registrar General or maybe just two or three days before. So you can see that at times it is planned. Go and register a business so that we can give you something to do. So the sole sourcing, and if you look at one of the, I've forgotten, one of the audits that was reported by the Auditor General, mm. he talked about how huge the, the fees charged by the single source or the sole sourcing uh, as against the others. I have the same example, mm. uh, experience. We came across a situation where there was this vendor who was giving single source procurement in the, in the government That's and they, they were supplying items to the government. We went into the shop to go and find the price, current, the current price. Remember, audit happens after. Mm -hmm. So it means they bought the thing a year or more earlier. When we checked the price, the price was less than a fifth of, of what, what they are presented to government. To government. And which, government which institution And is government this? was buying, this was local government. Uh, this, uh, what you call dustbins that they were using. Ah. In fact, the company is uh, Zoom Lion. We went to Zoom Lion itself. I sent people in a disguised name to say, look, go and get a quote from their shop to find out how much are they selling this. Then we look at the quote versus what is sold to the government. And I say, this is unacceptable. And anybody who knows that, this gentleman called uh, Manasseh Azuri mm -hmm. has been on that case for a very long time. We know that the contract which Zoom Lion is using expired a long time ago. They don't even go to public procurement authority to get a renewal or anything. Government after government, not only MPP government. Mm -hmm. NDC government was doing the same thing and it has been continued by MPP government. And, and so, there is no renewal of contracts? There yet. is no renewal of contract. They will tell you that contract can be renewed orally or verbally. And I say, why do you use uh, uh, cloth to patch metal. The, con the original contract was in writing. Mm -hmm. So if you want to re renew it, it must also be in writing. The first contract which expired, I think, 2013 or thereabout, was in writing. And that has absolutely and no And that contract basis. has been running, I think, up to today. I see. I see. And, and, you know, the explanation they gave has absolutely no legal basis. From my point of view, it doesn't. They claim there is because they said you can always enter into a contract orally. You can also do it with the in, government. In, yes, they said. Well, this, any contract can be in be oral or in writing. So they say it can be that. But if you look at the audit trail, you will see government after government, uh, especially the ministers who were in charge, local government, etc., fighting it. Everybody trying to disassociate himself. But at the end of the day, the contract still ran, and we are made to pay money. So at a point in time, I even disallowed for uh, 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 some of the expenditures of Zoom Lion mm. and said charge him 411 million. Mm. And, and he, as we know, we... He, he appealed against it. He actually appealed. Yeah. It went to the high court. The high court ruled against him. Then they appealed at the court of appeal. And very interestingly, <laughs> when the case went to uh, the court of appeal, you know what happened? They questioned the original jurisdiction of the Auditor General. To do that, that is the the, the constitutional mandate of the Director General, does it extend to the private sector? And the Court of Appeal said, well, this is interpretation of the Constitution, so it must go to Supreme Court. So they also play it into the yard of the Supreme Court. And there the funniest thing happened, from my point of view. When the question was asked, my lawyers were of the view that the question needed not to be answered again because it has already been answered in Occupy Ghana versus Attorney General, mm -hmm. where the Supreme Court, in directing the Auditor General to disallow and surcharge, defined person to mean public servants or others, or any other person. Mm -hmm. So we thought that definition has been done already, so we didn't need any interpretation. But the Supreme, came, Supreme Court came with some wishy-washy explanation. If any time I read that part, I don't even get the English. Maybe my English is not good enough. They tried to put in some English to say that there was no proof of, uh, what do you call it, uh, fraud or whatever. Mm. There is no fraud stated in the Constitution or any of the laws. Where mm. are they bringing this from? But that is what they used in exonerating uh, 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 Zoom Lion uh, in that case. That was the very, in fact, the truth is that that is the very time I was on leave. 
-huh. If I were not to be on leave, I was going to challenge the Supreme Court. I was going to tell them mm -hmm. that, please, what made you to depart from your earlier decision? Because you told me that I can hold not only public servants liable, but any other person whose misbehavior or misconduct bring about a loss. Mm -hmm. And I said that Zoom Lion has used the same set of documents to defend a payment twice. So this is a misconduct, it's a misbehavior, which I'm holding him. Tell me it's not a, mis a misconduct or misbehavior. I will agree and back yeah. off. But then to say that there must be fraud, where did the fraud come from? I see. But, uh, you know, away from the courts, on the subject of the pricing of the Zoom Lion beans, yeah. um, is it an issue of, you know, because wh whoever is receiving that will now then take the decision of whether or not this is too much based on ma uh, actual market price or this is good enough uh, to, be, to, to be engaged in by the government. So is it an issue of a lack of knowledge when it, when it comes to procurement or is it just a you know, shared taste for corruption? I'll take the latter. I think it is a shared case of uh, corruption, taste for corruption. But let me say that that is not what I say I disallow. I disallow. Oh, absolutely. Yes, that's not the one I disallowed. But I was talking about the situation where if... I am giving it to you as a single source, then I must ensure that there is value for money. Indeed. I must be sure that we are not wasting or being wasteful in spending public funds. But then you will find out that, no, it is not like that. Recently, when we looked at the, I think the Cocoa Board, or I've forgotten one of the reports issued by the Auditor General, Roots, Cocoa Roots, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are trying to say that the single source ones were about three times the price of those which went through the competitive uh, bidding. bidding. So in that case, why would you like to do that to public firms? Mm, I see. I, I want us to, uh, you know, just take a pause on uh, some of the challenges that you faced there yeah. uh, while you were there. We'll come back to your time there. But let, let's, let's talk about a, a, one of the things that we expect the Auditor General to be doing, which is asset uh, uh, declaration, asset and liabilities declaration. Good. We always seem to leave that part out. Um, how difficult was it for you to receive uh, these declarations from uh, you know, those, those who are supposed to declare? Well, it was not that difficult. Uh, let me say, I stated earlier on that when there are no consequences for misbehavior, uh, people misbehave. But when I assumed office and I noticed that there are far more people than those who are declaring their assets, I changed my style and I said, look, I'm not just going to sit there and ask you to declare or not. I wrote to the presidency and gave him a list of his ministers and uh, deputy ministers, etc., who have not declared, who from my point of view are occupying the, were occupying their offices unconstitutionally. This is also another argument or debate many times with the lawyers. I ask them, if the Constitution says declare your assets before you enter that office, and you enter that office several years, months, you have not declared, are you not occupying that office unconstitutionally? Hence, my personal view was that if you are found out to have declared your assets, you just be made to vacate your post. But when that letter went to the office of the president, they came running uh, to, declare to declare their assets. But there were still other groups who did not get the directive. I mm. think, I'm not too sure, maybe at a cabinet meeting or something of that nature, they were told they'll go and declare your assets because the president and the vice declared within two weeks. Mm. So Of receiving how, that letter? No, 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 no. Right. Of assuming office. Of assuming when office. they came to office, mm. they declared very early. So why will your boss declare and you will not declare? So I think that pushed them to declare, but others were not. So if you notice, I think 2018 or thereabout, I directed all the auditors to say that, look, one other mandate of the Auditor General under Article 286 is to ensure at, uh, asset declaration. Mm -hmm. In the course of your audit, find out from the person if he qualifies to declare his asset, whether he or she has declared the, that asset. So it becomes part of the audit questions. When they come, the first thing is, have you declared? Show evidence that you have declared. And I must say, funny enough, two days ago, or yesterday when I arrived, uh, yesterday, I arrived yesterday morning when I arrived, I got a call. And I was told that uh, there are auditors appointed by parliament to audit the office of the Auditor General. Mm -hmm. And they are looking for my asset declaration certificate. And is, I said, is that constitutional? And I asked whether the auditor reads the constitution. It's not part of his mandate. The constitution mandate 
parliament to appoint auditors to audit only the accounts of the office. It's my asset declaration part of the office. Mm -mm. You've forgotten that the auditor general has a different mandate under 286 for asset declaration, which he doesn't have. So I think the auditor is equating himself to auditor general. And so he's now doing that. I have them. I can't be sure to you. But I told the guy I will never show it to him. I will only show it to him at court, in court. If he dare mention my name anywhere, I sue him. We go to court and I prove to him that he was going beyond his mandate. So let me be honest. It was not too much a difficult thing. Mm. The challenge rather is to do with the system. It was manual. So you can imagine you go to the office. There are boxes of the declaration. And I was afraid that one morning I may wake up and I'll be called that maybe there is fire. Mm. And before I realize everything is gone, what do I do? What do I, uh, people will have to hold me accountable. So I started developing an IT platform where people can declare it uh, electronically instead of hard copies so that we can back it off on different servers and maybe in the clouds or wherever it is. We did that system, tested it with staff. Actually, you know, the audit service, a lot of them also fall within the same category. So we forced all of them to go online and declare their assets as a test run, mm. which they did and we were very happy with the system. I wrote even to the World Bank, since I was working in the World Bank before appointment as Auditor General, I wrote to them and said, look, I know you have a very strong IT unit. Can they come in and do a quality assurance of what we have designed. And they came and they came back and gave us a clean certificate that they think the system is robust enough mm. to go. So, so that is how it was before I left. Away from that, let's discuss your tenure a little bit because it was also very turbulent. While the president had promised the Ghanaian people to nip corruption in the bad, one of the steps it took was to appoint you because he trusted you a lot. Um, but, you know, getting to the end of that period, the second phase of your being Auditor General, uh, things went, went south between you and uh, the presidency. Uh, yeah, let me correct that a bit. It was not President Akufuado who appointed me. Right. I was appointed by President Mahama. Indeed. At a time when he had lost the election. So it was difficult. I mean, just before he was leaving office. Yes. He had lost the election, and just about a week to leave office, he appointed me. So I was a bit hesitant. And President Akufuado, the current president, then president elect, actually called me in person and said, Go and take the appointment. I've heard of you. When I come to office, I'll see how we work together. And truly, I think the second week of him being sworn into office, he called me to a meeting, and we worked very well. If you see the president's State of the Nation address, uh, to Parliament 2018. Check what he say, has to say about the Auditor General. Then if you look at, again, his speech at Independence 6 March 2018, he was full of praises for the Auditor General because I was holding his predecessor accountable. You see? So what changed? So, <laughs> what changed was that now we had entered 2018 from June. This, I'm telling you, is early part of 2018. That is, uh, Independence is March. The audit of 2017 had not even started, okay? So the audit of 2017 came, and the audit report came after June. Then the, the, the friction started. Mm. Then it was clear. You notice there were some findings, like a, a situation where uh, some ministers were using money. I mean, the famous one being your, your encounter with the senior minister. Yes. On Coral Associates. Yes. But that came later. The first one, I think, had to do with uh, Gate Fund where they were using part of the monies which were meant for needy by brilliant student to travel abroad for courses. And I disallowed it, and I didn't like the idea. So eventually, uh, eventually they, they kicked you out of office. Of course, yes. I, I know, uh, retrospectively, you had a ruling that uh, said that that was wrong. Yes. Right. But let's look at that period when you were kicked out of office. One of the things that they had talked about, in fact, two, uh, from the board was your age and your nationality. It had nothing to do with the kind of work you were doing. Yes. So are you Ghanaian and were you 60 at the time? <laughs> well, you should look at the nature or the modus operandi of the board. The board was in to do the bidding of the president and they were looking at anything at all to throw at me. If you had informed me about this before coming, I was going to bring a copy of my SNIT form for you to see. Anybody who works at SNIT, or if you like, go to SNIT and you check. You will see that the SNIT ID, which they give you, reflects first the, the region in which you were registered. So mine starts with E. Then the second two letters, 
tells the district in which you are registered. That's, mine is 10, that is district 10, which is quote. Okay? Then the next one is the year in which you were born, the month in which you were born, and the date on which you were born. And it is clearly stated that 1960, mm -hmm. uh, 1961. So it is not 1960. Okay? What happened is that, you know, those of us who did not have the benefit of having literate parents, mm. it is very difficult to tell exactly the date on which you were born. Of course, I don't think you, were, you knew the day you were born. You were told. Mm -hmm. You met documents. Okay? So personally, it took my elder brother, who was the most educated at the age of 13. He's 13 years older than me. He was the one who kept the date. So it was being between 1960 and 1961. 1960 and 1961. And personally, I like the 1960 because it is round. It makes a mm -hmm. easy referring to. It was when later on I, come, I came across what we call the baptismal register. Right. You know, the Catholics. I'm a Catholic. I was born mm -hmm. a Catholic. I was baptized only 25 days when I was on this earth. So I worked a bit as a catechist in the village. I was helping the church. And I have to enter people's reg uh, baptism in the register. Then I flipped and then I came across my date. In that date, it, with that register is still there. Mm. But I contacted, just a minute, please uh -huh. spare, uh, spare me this. I contacted the parish priest and that register is still available today. So based upon that, I saw my date of birth. And by virtue of computer today, I also check and that matches with my name Yao. Mm. Because if I was born on, uh, in 1960, first June, I would have been Kweku, not Yao. So I noticed that. That time, my, my late father was alive. So I went to SNE to see how I correct this. I was advised to come with uh, an affidavit and get one from my father. We did this and sent to uh, SNE, and the changes were made. I have a statement from SNE, which has the corrected version. But now, if you go, they have reversed it to, to the 1960. I Interestingly, see. let me make, finish this. I know you are in a hurry to interrupt me, but please allow me to say this. If you go now and check, you see place of birth, Togo, not, not even a town, Togo. Mm. That's what is written on the place of birth. Then the district of birth goes out. It's Togo in goes out. Then country of birth, Ghana. So Togo is in goes out in Ghana. I said, these guys were not smart. Mm. When they were even so, changing, they so, didn't so, I change. mean, so the, mini, the, the system was manipulated to provide evidence exactly. that you were born in 1960 exactly. and you're Togolese. Yes. But, you, you know, the, the board, according to the board, they had also written to you about that, giving you a, a lot of opportunity to respond to, to them. I that. responded to them, and they said it was not acceptable to them. I stated it. I see. But, that, but your, fr the, your friction with the board was much more than just you know, age uh, and uh, uh, nationality. You thought the board was interfering with your It work. was a far more than age and nationality. The first thing Dwajimai did was that he thought he was still Auditor General, the board chairman. Mm -hmm. When he came in, I was in Kigali. What brought the friction is this. I was in Kigali when I got a call from my deputy that he has asked him to invite an audit team which was auditing, uh, what do you call it, national health insurance to come to his office for a meeting. I said, why? I don't believe that. So write me. So she wrote me. And when she wrote me, I responded and copied the chairman, that is Dua mm -hmm. to find out if it was true. And he said it was true. So I asked what mandate did he have? Because people think that the board of audit service is the same as the board of maybe TV3. Mm -hmm. No, the constitution clearly spell out their mandate. Their mandate has nothing to do with audit. So I told him he should take his hands off. Mm -hmm. That is where the friction started. Do you know what Dua Jimai did? When I wrote him to take his hands off, he wrote, uh, what do you call it, uh, a memo to the entire board based upon what had happened between him and myself and attached the audit observations of National Health Insurance to the memo. And the next day, when I was coming to office, I think I was around the Tekwashi when Joy FM called me that they wanted us to discuss uh, those uh, audit findings. And I said, no, the audit has not even gone anywhere, so there are no findings. To discuss. And they said they have seen the uh, audit observations. And I said, okay, so if you have seen audit observations, share with me mm -hmm. so that I can, we can be speaking from the same hymn book. Then when they shared with me, I noticed that what he has sent to the board 
had circulated all over the place. I see. So the friction had been there long time ago. I see. But, but while you were there, do you think that you had maybe a bit of trust issues, some ego at play as well? Because perhaps you thought that everyone was corrupt except you. I have never thought any everyone was corrupt. <laughs> maybe that is... Or risk, what, risk or, corruption. Or, or, or maybe that's what you think. I, I thought I had been given a role to play and I must play that role. It was not based upon the fact that you are corrupt or you are not corrupt. Remember, in financial management and accounting, we base it on facts. Even if I think you are corrupt, I have no reason of saying so until I have the evidence to support it. So that was not uh, anything to go by. So there were no trust issues there? No trust issue at all. As far as I'm concerned, in fact, recently I was just addressing a group in, in Monrovia and I was telling them that in auditing, we don't trust. It's evidence. If you say you have paid the money, where's the evidence? It's as simple as that. So whether you did it right or you didn't did, do it right depends upon the evidence that you are able to adduce before the auditors. When we come back, let's discuss the recent Public Accounts Committee hearings that we've seen. Has there been any deterrence at all? We'll be right back. Don't go away. Welcome back to Hot Issues. My guest is Daniel Domilevo, who is a former Auditor General. We've been discussing all things audits. And right now we want to put some of the things that he left behind as his legacy to test. Uh, again, thank you for your patience. So uh, recently we've seen uh, the public accounts hearings. Um, there are still unearned salaries going on there. There's still, uh, you know, procurement challenges going on there. But, I mean, something should have deterred somebody at this point. Because you surcharged a lot of people, you disallowed a lot of expenditure. Why do you think that we still see that? Well, it's, uh, let me say that the infractions are never going to go away. It is a human institution. And administering billions of Ghana cities, definitely there will be irregularities. However, the worrying part of it is that instead of it decreasing significantly, mm -hmm. I see it rather on, on a rise, which I told you from my point of view, is because there are no consequences for uh, mismanagement. If you watch uh, a, a, a video clip or uh, social media, there was a clip about the president of Malawi, who following audit on COVID, uh, uh, COVID funds, uh, a portion who had been taken by one of the ministers to travel, and he refunded it when he came back. But the president said the time the money was needed, you had taken it away, so it could not be used at the right time. Mm -hmm. So he was dismissed. He asked the police to prosecute him. If we have this type of into, uh, uh, intolerance or lack of tolerance for infractions, it would have reduced things significantly. I do remember myself, uh, when I was in office, my staff were telling me that institutions which never took their observations seriously and did not respond, were now responding on time because they knew the guy was going to disallow and hold you accountable. You may go to court and be free, but you may not be lucky. Some got away with it in right. court. Others did not. Some were thrown away. People didn't know that. People think that almost all the disallowances and set charges. I had one uh, uh, broadcaster, I forgot his name, who was saying that they said that I did 11 certificates which were set charges. I said, who said I did 11? I did more than 100. Mm -hmm. So, and even I, I, I say that if I did five and five had been ch challenged and overturned by the court, you may not be lucky as the others. So it brings some deterrence. But people continuously see that, ah, there is avenue for gambling with public funds. The worst that may happen is that they say, I should refund, and lit the litigation may go on forever. It's cheaper than going for a bank loan, isn't mm -hmm. it? The bank will definitely come the very day it's due and start demanding their money. But this one, you can gamble with it. That is why we are seeing what is happening at I the mean, public accounts. I, I, indeed, one of the things that came up was the Ejapa royalties were $12 million had been spent, uh, but we hadn't even, uh, you know, done any real work yet. I mean, how could such a thing happen? That is what I'm saying, that the system is tolerating the irregularities. If it had happened earlier on, it was nipped in the pad, and people were not tolerated, or even government sanctioning the various people Remember, Martin Amidi did a, a, what do you call it, risk analysis or whatever mm -hmm. it is on it, and actions were taken 
People have been deterred. But then they came strong and said, no, we have to do it. So the impunity continues. And like I told you earlier on, it is the tone at the top which deters public servants. It's just like your father will allow it. If your big brothers are bullying you, you only pray that your father arrives. The president then, hasn't lived to the promise of... I don't think so. If, if, if by the time there is, uh, what do you call it? I've forgotten the name we call it. Uh, the risk analysis of Ajapa was done and people's head started rolling. I think we will not be told today that so much has been paid. Really? And I don't know. Since we got to know, I don't know the date the audit report came out. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, uh, I've not been there in the town for many times. I just hear, heard it in the person. What has happened? What has happened? If monies which should not be paid have been paid, 12 million is not small money, it's my not. sister. It's not small money. And we are taxing people. Mm -hmm. In fact, we are moving the country from taxation to robbery instead of to production that we were promised. Now we are robbing everybody. Even your money that you are using to pay them, they tax you on it. So this is robbery. We are robbing people and use it this way. Uh, I, I can't get it. Mm. So it is the tone at the top which determines. Leadership, from my point of view, is everything. I leadership mean, so, is everything. Right, so if, if leadership was serious about fighting corruption, what are some of the changes that you expect to see, not only at the Auditor General, but generally in the fight against corruption? I know you talked about sanctions, but I mean, what, what would you have expected to see, particularly with a man who came in on the promise of fighting corruption? How right many now? government officials have been accused of corruption? And what has happened to them? If nothing happens to them, then others will also join. But the OSP, the I mean, the... again, let me no, not take, I'm take, not it, take it up. You forget OSP. about OSP. From the presidency itself, saying that, Daniel, you have been cited in this case, so you are sacked. Or, you, I relieve you, go and clear yourself and come. But accusation of corruption is not conviction of corruption. No, not at all. Mm -hmm. But just showing that you are not tolerating it is a different thing altogether. Do you understand? I'm not saying that the fact that you are even suspended or you are released from your position means that you are guilty of corruption. No. But then it gives the signal to government officials, that they will not be tolerated. Mm. But if they think that they will be tolerated, then it will go and on. And you think there's been a lot of tolerance here? I, I think the president has been too tolerant when it comes to corruption. Is there room for redemption, you know, as his tenure goes, goes to an end? There is a big room for redemption. In fact, if the president turns a new leaf tomorrow, it will be so much to his credit. It's just like goes call last minute, you know? I always tell people that at times the goals called in the extra time are sweeter than even those called in the, the normal time. Assuming from tomorrow we see that, no, he said, no, I'm left with six months or uh, eight months <laughs> and I'm not going to tolerate, uh, tolerate corruption. Once I hear your name, you'll be on the firing line. It will be very sweet do you and see, nice. Do you see a knack for change? Uh, I have my doubts. I don't think it's going to happen. You don't think I it's don't think to... it's going to happen. Because it's also difficult to change when you have allowed the system for such a long time. It takes someone who said, no, this is not right. I won't do it again. Mm. Who can do that? But I'm not seeing that. So you, you were appointed by Mahama while he was leaving office. Yeah. The assumption was that so that you could uh, 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 make, make life miserable for the NPP. That was your assumption. No, hang on. The, the assumption of the public. Yes. Uh, or, or certain, you know, sympathizers of the, of the party in office now. Yes. Was that you should make their life miserable. Then they kicked you out. Yes. Now, Mahama is hoping to return to office. If he does appoint you again, would you? No, I made a point which people don't want to listen. And maybe you also didn't listen. Even though Mahama appointed me, the current president personally intervened and said, because I went away, I was in Malawi, when he called me, that I hear that you have gone back to Malawi. You don't want to accept the appointment. Go and accept no, it. No, I get that. So he well, was part of it. So, so, what, so what, 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 I'm, your, what I'm saying... Where's your beef? I, I, no, I don't have a beef. What I'm okay. saying is that the moment you started to become a thorn in their flesh, you were kicked out based on yes. what, whatever they, they determine as the technicality. Yes. Right? Yeah. If you remember what I told you, we were the best of friends. We were the best of friends the first year when I was holding Muhammad administration. So, Remember, audit happens after the year. Indeed. So when I started work 2017, we were auditing 2016, mm -hmm. which was Muhammad time. If you remember, I disallowed 5.4 billion uh, expenditure. And he praised me very well. In fact, I remember he met me at the Accra International Conference. He came and shook my hand and said, Bema Kosu, 
that is continue what you are doing. I see. So we were best of friends. The problem about accountability is that everybody wants accountability for others, not for himself. That's the problem. I see. So th that happened. Yes. Uh, if the or if or when the Mahama administration comes back into office and you're given uh, the Auditor General again, is there something you take up? Oh, let's get to the bridge and we see Are how we cross it. Are you interested in, in no, returning No, I, I to don't office. like to pre, uh, uh, come across assumptions and providing answers about that. I don't think that is even going to happen. So let us get to the bridge, but I don't think I'm going to come back as Auditor General of Ghana. I, I want to ask you something. While you audited the 2016 era of the Mahama administration, yes. were they as bad as this administration? No, if you look at the, tra uh, the, the trend, you see that things are going from bad to worse. Even this administration, 2017 was better than 2018. 2018 was better than 20. If you look at the table, I introduced that table. I wanted Ghanaians to see the trend. So at first, they would have just prepared a table showing the infractions. So I told the people, no, we have produced earlier reports. For Ghanaians to see the trend, let's put the previous years inside. So the trend is there for everyone to see. It is going from, I remember some time ago, even when the current Auditor General took over, he reported 12, uh, 12, 12 billion for state enterprises. The following year, he reported 17 billion. So mm. it is getting up we, and up. We don't learn. But why don't you want to ever be president of Ghana? That's what you told me. How, why would I be a president of Ghana? People will run and leave me alone in this country. I'm a very crazy person. Because I, once they say here is white and here is black, I will not change the two colors. Those who knew me know that I will not tolerate it. And to become a president with that, you will hear that the minister who has been uh, designated, designated, even before vetting, has been sacked. And, and, and you may not like it. You say I'm a crazy guy. So please, lead me not into temptation. It will not happen. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Yes. My guest today has been Daniel Domelovo, former Auditor General. We've been discussing all issues, audit and corruption and public sector uh, malfeasance as far as the financial sector is concerned. I am Kemeni Amano. If you missed this episode, there's always a playback on our social handles, Facebook and Twitter or X now and also on YouTube. Bye-bye.